All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Better late than never, I guess. Sorry, I'm a little late. I had some technical issues when I got here today. Nothing that was insurmountable and that we can't solve. But uh, it's interesting getting your head out of one uh, <laughs> one mode into another, like road, home. How does all this stuff work again? It takes me a second to remember how the, how my studio works. But anyways, yeah, I just had a little plug-in uh, authorization issue. Uh, so I had to resort to using my uh, my Logitech microphone today, which is fine. It doesn't really, you guys don't care, I'm sure. It probably doesn't sound quite as good as usual, uh, but whatever. Uh, oh, wow, there's a fellow from India in the house. That's cool. Um, my friend Henry is, is on a boat right now off of India uh, and sailing around doing a gig. He was a keyboard player from Classic Rock Show. He, he traveled 19 hours from New York City the other day and, uh, and ended up uh, over there and um, got on a boat. And He's doing a gig for three weeks. Pretty wild. No rest for the wicked. Uh, you got guitar says, what interface are you using? Well, normally I would be using, to speak right now and everything, be using a... Uh, ua uh apollo but i had a plug-in authorization thing this morning i need to refresh some stuff and so right now i'm just literally going straight into the computer with a logitech microphone because i was it was taking too long to solve um uh, so i'll figure that stuff out tomorrow uh what do i think of an sl67 on top of a pt15 212 uh, pretty cool. I mean, because the PT-15, well, okay, a PT-15-212 will have green back and and uh, V-30. To be honest, I mean, it's it's probably cool. The, I think the head is probably a little wider than the cabinet, just a little bit, but it'll it'll sound pretty cool. Um, V-30s are never my favorite speaker with a Plexi. It tends to work with uh amplifiers with a little more gain in the front end and they sound a little weird to me i don't know why did you guys ever find that like a v30 with a with a plexi kind of amp doesn't it just doesn't do it for me it's not the right speaker for for it for me but an h30 can be cool and uh and a, and a greenback can be cool um anyways uh but uh the the horizontal 212 uh, for the original, you know, the original PT cab has a couple of uh, Creamback H75s in it, and those sound pretty darn good with the with an SL68. Uh, so, uh, looks like there's some hockey on tomorrow. But, you know, I haven't been following it all. I'm sorry, but uh, if you say that there's a game I should be watching tomorrow, I'm going to watch. So, um, yeah, I'm, I generally get involved in watching in the playoffs, but I've been, it's just been kind of a crazy time, like finishing up the tour and stuff like that. Now getting back home and stuff, I've been home about, I don't know, 48 hours or something. And, uh, and, uh, I'll get into, into home stuff here in a second. <laughs> uh, last night I, I went to the, uh, Maynard Keenan, uh, it was, uh, his 60th birthday and it was at the Hollywood Bowl. And um, thank you, Billy Howardell, for making that happen. I, I ended up there, and it was absolutely brilliant. It was uh, it was a perfect circle, Pussifer and uh, uh, Primus, all playing kind of back to back on one stage. And they would each band would kind of play a song or two, and then they'd switch seamlessly. So they had literally like I don't know, like three bands worth of inputs going for monitors and for front of house. It was insane. And they would all just like the, there was a, so many mixing desks <laughs> in the front of house position, and uh, the visuals were great. And it was just it was like the greatest 60th birthday party. Basically, the dude did what he wanted for his 60th birthday and, and put on this incredible gig, and uh, uh, it was really great. And then at the end, Tool showed up, and so you had a, all of the perfect circle like original lineup sitting up there on the. Uh, they had couches on either side of the rise. There was risers with three drum kits on the back of the stage. You can see it on my Instagram. And there were couches on either side. So the bands would just sit on the couches and watch the other band play, you know, and have a drink and stuff. And just hang out and talk. And then when it came time for them to play, you could see them kind of go down the stairs on the stage. You go off to the side, grab guitars, get ready for the next song. And then they would play. It was so cool. It's like all your friends hanging out and all your collaborators hanging out for your party. Um, and 
yeah, it's just awesome. And then Tool playing at the end with all of a perfect circle sitting on the couch watching. That was pretty cool. What a great 60th birthday. Like all your bands you've been a part of all hanging out. It's incredible. So, loved it. Um, and then Mighty Church is actually asking about the Vi and Joe show. Uh, uh, that I saw. When the heck was it now? I guess it was it last Sunday. It was. So it was right after I was doing Sunday Live. That's right. And so it was great. Steve and Joe were great. Um, Steve was really kind, and I spoke to him for a little while afterwards, as well as uh, Brian Beller, who's really nice. Talked to both of them for a little while. I thought the guitar tones were terrific in the PA, um, and the mix overall, just everything. It was a really enjoyable show. Great display of everything those guys have got to offer. It was really, really fun. So it's been a, a, a lot of uh, really good musical uh, things I've seen recently, which is, you know, just, it's it's uh, it's not lost on me. It's really fun. Um, to, to I'm still just a fan. I love all this stuff. Uh, it's great to be a fan. And, and uh, also great to go see some shows where, you know, the guitar is so, you know, it's awesome great guitar sounds and stuff great bass sounds last night as well uh have you tried the new marshall 1959 hand wired i've heard them i think they're good um i think it's a really good amp uh you know they've got a lot of competition with things like the sl68 and friedman 2 amp and things like that out there um but it's a great if you can get one for a good price and stuff uh it's nothing absolutely nothing wrong with them I and mean, they're really well made um you know as far as i can tell seem you know like the, everything's tight so um pretty cool i thought i had a mouse problem here i think it's time for a new studio computer too guys because my my computer takes so long to wake up and kind of like the mouse even to connect took like five minutes <laughs> it was like this isn't working i'm in kind of a rush here i gotta get going do sunday live my mouse I just noticed is working i have my backup usb mouse plugged in so it's interesting or not um yeah, I might I might upgrade the the get a new you know Mac Studio or whatever sometime pretty soon. I think at the time is here. I bought this one way back before doing Pete Thorne too. So the one I'm on right now. Uh, yeah, that's that's about their lifespan. Jay says my EVH guitar is breaking strings at the bridge. I replaced the saddle insert blocks, but it's still breaking on the A and D. Uh, I would probably have somebody look at it. Yeah, a qualified tech. Um, Look at the saddles and maybe you do a little polishing with a Dremel or something like that. Because it could be, you know, I mean, how how often do they break? Um, do they break after like a week or, you know, how much use do you get out of them before they break? Because maybe you're just really using the bridge a lot or the tremolo. But if you're not and they seem to be breaking like after a few days or something, then it, you know, it sounds to me like probably it's a saddle issue of some sort. And the general thing to do there is polish them with something like a Dremel. And, you know, I, I think that's what uh uh you know somebody like sir would use you know and uh, just kind of make sure there's no rough spots or burrs or anything like that on the saddles you could also also try and get some upgraded saddles from somebody like you know uh, a few tone or something order like a set of new saddles maybe uh the the insert blocks won't really do anything those are just those just clamp the string literally it's where the string's passing over the the, the the saddle so you might you might consider some upgraded saddles or something um look at the fu tone stuff they make such nice stuff you know uh yeah i mean you might spend as much taking it somewhere to get the saddles worked on on the guitar as you would for some replacements too you know uh that's probably not true probably cost more for replacements but uh you know what i'm getting at you know what i'm saying uh any thoughts on our news on i don't think this is you're saying divided by 13 making saturani that eddie van halen amp it's not divided by 13 it's actually third power um i get i divided by 13 third power i can it's probably easy to mix those two up but divided by 13 i guess fred sold to uh the two rock folks so i think they're now kind of producing both uh which is interesting uh, Chris Quinn says hi from cloudy Santa Monica. I was thinking about taking a bike ride out there later. So, uh, but usually, usually burns off by noon or something. It's not cloudy in the valley. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
uh, you need to do a clean install of your Mac OS. Yeah, probably right. Just getting a little, we used to call it disfragmentation or something. <laughs> I don't know what you'd call it now. But I, I do think also it's just that the computer is, they get a, I mean, I know what you mean. If I, yeah, there's probably ways around, uh, like, like ways to speed it up and stuff like that. But I do feel like it's kind of time, like, because this computer is a, I think the late 2015 or early 2016, and we're almost 10, we're nine years on now. And I, I, I tend to like what I'm doing. I mean, I just want them to, you know, start up and kick ass and be fast and do, you know, video editing and stuff like that. It, it's just as, as time marches on, it seems like I always need a faster one, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. What do you think, Rob? Like would just the, just a clean install would fix it. I've always felt like after eight or nine years, it's uh, planned obsolescence or something with Apple. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, what else are you guys talking about? Just looking through the chat here. Have you seen this uh, Tone X1 making the rounds on the forums? I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> I'm not going to comment one way or another because I, I uh, let's just say that if it is, I don't think it was supposed to be as of, but uh, I don't know what you're talking about, but I might know what you're talking about sometime next week. <laughs> uh, will you be getting your hands on the new Sir Two Post Bridge? Um, yeah, so that's interesting too. You guys know about all kinds of things that I didn't know that people know about, but yeah, they do have a new Two Post Bridge that's uh really really nice um i guess since you're talking about it i can talk about it uh the the tuning seems really quite good on it john basically had a lot to do with the way the i think the string comes out of the block and breaks over the saddle and stuff and so he seems to think that with a certain design that he came up with that uh tuning stability is better for your standard bridge and i tried it a little bit and it seemed quite good to me so um yeah so that's uh, uh that's a little little news there but yeah i would like uh to 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 uh you know i've got this guitar right here as a matter of fact that maybe i could try it on this guitar does seem to stay in tune quite well isn't that pretty god look at that like plastic blue <whistles> i love this thing this guitar you've seen me play it a little bit look at those frets Ooh man it it feels so good this guitar um it's a one that I've had for a long, long time, and I didn't play for a long time because it had a neck on it I didn't really like. It was for someone else, and it was very wide and thin, and it just wasn't my thing on a Strat. Um, so I eventually had it re-necked, and it's got a light bird's eye roasted with uh, butcher block finish and kind of the, the 6105 or whatever size frets, whatever they are, Jess car equivalent. And uh, this has a compound 9 to 12 radius on it, which I really love, actually, for a little bit more of that vintage thing and the old Strat. So anyway, this is a great guitar. But yeah, I, I would like to try that bridge on here and see what I hear and what the tuning's like. This one's really quite good. I guess, I assume this is just a Goto. Um, and, it, and it is quite good. I find the tuning stability on this guitar for whatever reason. But let's let's just experiment and maybe screw that up no i'm sure it'll be just as good if not better if i get if i put the new sir one on there but yeah uh yeah 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 i'm gonna give that a try <laughs> all right ian says what's up brother uh home from practice glad to see you again and meet you in syracuse great to meet you as well dude great to meet you as well it was a uh a fun one uh Boy, we've had uh, a, a great run, uh, 17 shows in the States. It was so much fun to, to play a bunch of tunes and uh, come rock out with, with all you nice folks in America. Good times. So, so I feel like it was a real success and uh, hopefully be even better next year. There's a super chat there from Arthur. No questions, real comments, or dirty words. Just throwing down some support. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Sorry I was late today, guys. I just kind of like... It's, Taking me a minute to get back in the swing, but also I had that technical issue when I uh, when I got started with uh, some plugin authorizations that I would normally be using right now, and I am not. I'm using the Logitech internal camera microphone because that was just what I decided to do. Uh, JJ's asking once again, 
That was the Sachin Vi show. Uh, and thanks again, Arthur, for that super chat. Uh, JJ, it was great. It was awesome. Um, both guitar players were terrific. They ended up uh, at the end playing some really fun covers. There were some great back and forth jams. Um, you know, Steve's set was, was I think, really exceptional. Uh, he's such a great guitar player and, and musician and just he knows how to, you know, ride that wave for like an hour or 90 minutes. He can take you on a ride with instrumental guitar like not too many can, I find. So he's really great. And uh, he's, a, he's a gift to the guitar community. He really is. I, I think he's just wonderful. So... Uh, wondering uh, about speaker wattage and what difference in low versus high watt speakers. Um, well, generally, lower watt speakers for whatever reason. I don't really know why. Uh, probably because they can be made a little lighter and to respond a little. You know, they're not so heavy duty, so they tend they tend to have a bit more of a uh, well, more top end many times, um, but not in a bad way, like a like a different things so so like if we take a greenback which is a 25 watt speaker generally speaking right and what we think of as a greenback and then if we take a g12h30 sometimes they used to call those greenbacks too but it confused things so those became 30s and we call greenbacks greenbacks and g12h30s uh or sometimes some people call them greenback 30s but anyway there's a bigger magnet on those on the 30 watt speaker I think it's a 30 ounce or 35 ounce versus 40, right? Something like that. So the bigger magnet tends to give you bigger highs, bigger lows, just kind of a wider, to me, like a G12H30 just sort of has a wider frequency response overall, whereas a greenback's a little more mid-centric, um, but still with nice kind of this woody top end thing that's really nice. Um, there's a clarity to it. And they seem to be just kind of, I don't know, they just seem to respond in a way that's uh, friendly with a Marshall style or Vox or something, that style amplifier, a greenback. And it's got this kind of woody, they're a little darker and less, like, so if you play them clean, they don't have a, a really amazing sparkly highs. They can sound a little flat or a little lackluster or something clean, but that's exactly what makes them sound really good dirty, I think. Because once you start adding dirt and the more harmonics and stuff start getting blown up and stuff in the tone, the greenback, for whatever reason, has just got this nice woody voice that's really cool. Whereas a speaker that's got a little more top end can sound a little more uh, maybe shrill or you know a little bright and edgy sometimes with a with a distorted amp. Um, so when it comes to wattage, like I find if you go from um, a greenback to let's say a 65 watt creamback, they do they sound a little darker still and like it's a, a little more mids maybe and then if you go to the red back in the celestion which is 100 150 watt speaker i think darker still but still with that kind of cool greenback mid range you, know, you might like the dark you know i don't know that if you were playing clean and compressed with the strat in position two or four that it would have enough articulation for a lot of people it might not but with a dirty marshall sound it's kind of cool so that's what I found. Same thing with the scumbags. When you go from the, the 25 watt one to the 65 watt to the 100, they tend to get darker sounding. I don't know what is more doping or more if it's just built a little heavier duty for the more power handling and stuff and it makes the speaker just move in a different way or what the heck. I'm, I'm sure Jim from Scumback or the selection folks can probably explain it better. But generally, I find it's a similar sound, but we're getting darker, you know. So for the, the real deal thing, the real you know response or whatever uh that that you know the true whatever greenback sound it just seems like the 25 watt is is kind of the way to go because they're already kind of dark because they have the, I, I think the magnet is another thing that affects the the brightness and the bigness of the sound so when you go from the smaller magnet of a greenback to the bigger magnet that's on a say a an h30 or or a, a v32 has them um that bigger magnet tends to produce like a bigger bass and a bigger top end and it tends to sound the result is maybe it sounds like the mids are a little more flat or less prominent um i really love the g12 uh h75 is that what it's called h75 creamback that's the speaker that we used in the 212 for the pt100 it's a very very balanced speaker it somehow manages to sound great dirty uh well albeit sounding maybe a little bit more top endy but really nice, full, dirty tone, and also have a great articulate, clean sound. So I think it's a very, very nice speaker all around. Yeah. 
uh, that's in a, a you know a little a little more power handling. Um, it'll work good in a combo. Seems to work good in an open back. Uh, is there any news about the PT fifty? I got to go out there and have a see where we're at and stuff. But you know, it's, it was you know I think the goal was really you know next year like that was that was the goal. So I got to go see where we're at. Um, uh, just because I've been away a lot, so I've been out on the road and stuff. Going to go see those fellows and see how the progress is going. But uh, uh, so more to report on that at some point soon. You got gear says the Tonex is really good. It's just not as good or high fidelity as a real amp. Well, I guess it's all relative. I mean, it, it's a it's a really really great piece of gear for what it is. I find um, the Tonex, you know, as well as the Quad Cortex, the captures, you know, Kemper. It's not exactly the same as the real deal, but what a great tool, right? We can't argue. Like it's pretty, pretty darn cool to have a tool that will do what those things do uh, and get you somewhere in the zone. Um, you know, but with you know, the incredibly you know ease of use and small package and all that stuff, right? So it's not exactly the same, I wouldn't say, but it's it's pretty pretty darn close to the experience. They really are good these days, and all that kind of stuff, the capturing, profiling, etc. Just a small thanks for getting me into Sir, says Jeff. Uh, thanks for the super chat there. Appreciate that. You're somewhere in the UK. I got this classic ass Paulana. That's a very light guitar. I traded five guitars to get this. It's my fourth Sir. I've got a P T15 and Ombre. The gear and customer service is untouchable. I agree, man. Um, they do a great job, and they really care about their customers and quality. So I'm glad you're happy. Those those guitars are uh, are pretty neat. Those really light ones are easy on the on the shoulders. That's for sure. Polona, but that, do I say that right? Polo Polonia Polonia Polona. <laughs> I'm not saying it anywhere near right, am I? Polonia Polonia. Oh my God. Uh, yeah 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 yeah. Uh, okay. What else are we talking about? Where's the merch? Oh, do I not have, I don't know what, I, I was rushing to put my links in the uh, video description because I was running a little late. So maybe I didn't put any in. Maybe that's what you're talking about. I'm not sure. Uh, generally speaking, I've always got uh, uh, some stuff down below in the video description as well as stuff that appears below videos for hoodies and t-shirts and stuff. And I really need to get some new merch going and I will do that sometime soon. All right. Uh, Rob says, I gave up trying to fix my two fender strats with dead areas on an ebony fingerboard next. Okay. Mm. Bought two KLOS. Is that like the radio station? Carbon fiber C next. Medium jumbo stainless steel frets. Guaranteed to not have dead areas. I guess ebony can have some dead areas sometimes. I've noticed that a little bit. Uh, but I guess any neck can. You know, I mean, fender bases are famous for having it. You know, rosewood necks. And certain dead spots here and there uh jim says try an ssd drive i do have ssd in my all my computers including the one that i'm on right now and it yeah you're 100 right an old computer with a hybrid drive or a regular disk drive is nothing compared to an ssd but even on the computers with ssds i find they slow down after you know i've got that going on this one that i'm on right now the slow startup and all that. Maybe that is something that could be just fixed by a, a clean install of an OS, new OS. Uh, have you filmed your Plex demo for Friedman? I have not. But I think he's going to ask me to do that relatively soon. Uh, Ryan Hurd says, Greenback, 35 ounce. Yeah, 30 watt, 50 ounce. Well, I thought it was 40. What do I know? But I knew it was bigger. Uh, so 35 ounce magnet or uh, uh, the, yeah, so for the 30 watts, it's basically, I think those are kind of the two Celestian magnet sizes, right? The the smaller uh, the 35 ounce or didn't they call it 30 ounce for a while or something? Maybe not, but anyway, that one, there's, those two magnet sizes are the ones that I see over and over and over with the different speakers. Uh, yeah, Rob saying, yeah, SSD. Yeah, no, no, no. I've got I, I ordered this computer with the fastest video card at the time for video editing that I could say it's a kind of top line iMac from 2015 with the SSD and the whole nine yards, but it's still like nine years old. And you know, we're already on to M2 chips or whatever, or is there even another one? 
Is there an M3 yet? Probably. That I don't know about. I mean, look, I bought a laptop a little over a year ago and it had the M1, and then boom, the M2 was out next month. It's like, geez, you can't even give me a month. To... <laughs> Anyways, any thoughts on the 20 watt greenback compared to the 25? So, I think you're talking about the Eddie Van Halen speaker, or uh, if you're not, you're talking about the original greenbacks that, you know, were rated for 20 watts in the mid 60s. Um, the EVH speaker that's rated at 20 watts, that was just a uh, uh, sticker. They evidently were the same as the Heritage greenbacks that were 25 watts. So in other words, it's a 25 watt speaker. So Heritage greenbacks, EVH, whatever, 25 watts, the 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 regular line greenback also 25 watts. I don't know why they, I, I think it was a weird decision to do that, to be honest, to, to, to just for the sticker on the back to tell people it was 20 watts why would why would you tell people it was rated less than it actually is but they did that <laughs> and here's the confusion uh there's jen what's up jen Missouri? uh pete's back home just like me although i'm back on the other side of the pond and jet lag like hell i'm a little like jet laggy as well even three hours off just still screwing me up a little bit um just a little bit but uh Good to see you back home. I hope your tour was awesome. Drinks and Jam says, I've been not interested, inspired to play guitar for a month. Well, sometimes you just need a break, you know. Um, maybe, maybe go back and listen to some of the stuff that originally got you into it. Like if you haven't listened to those albums in a while or those bands, just when you're driving in the car or something, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it turned you on in the beginning you know that's why it was great to go see joe and and steve the other day because it reminds me of being young you know and having that uh fire you know to play and i you know hearing joe play surfing with the alien or something you know it's like okay i remember being like as soon as it comes on you feel that that sensation of like yeah that's what i was into you know um so uh yeah um or try and find some new inspiration you know new guitar players um that that blow your mind you know on you know probably part of the problem i think is that everything's so phone and instagram and it's not the same listening experiences that we used to have when we'd put on i mean i think i own those records on uh like definitely on CD, if not vinyl, though, like probably surfing with the alien on vinyl, you know, and just put on the record player, <laughs> you know, it's cool. Like uh, that listening experience is always fun. So, you know, trying to do it as a little bit less of background music and a little bit more like the prominent thing that you're doing, maybe sit down and listen to some music that originally turned you on, you know, and see if that fires you up again. Uh, generally, when I listen to songs, you know, that I was into when I was a kid, it takes me right back. And I go, oh, yeah, I remember this. You know, I put on uh, Supertramp the other day, uh, you know, take the long way home off of and uh, gone Hollywood off of um, the Breakfast in America album. That's the first album I went out and bought with my own money. And every time I listen to it, I'm like, man, I, I lucked out as far as getting a great record for my very first record that I went out and purchased because it's such a stellar album. And it kind of just takes me back. And I'm like, this is so good, you know, this songs and stuff. So, uh, do you have any Ibanez? Right there. That's my Ibanez. <laughs> Only one I've ever actually owned. Uh, 76 Destroyer. Uh, do you know about the Sir Paulonia? <laughs> do they dent easily? Um, probably do uh I, I would say i wouldn't like ram a screwdriver into it because it's soft wood you know it's it's softer i think than probably basswood i mean i'm not 100 sure about that but it's very light and i do have one guitar that's it's a gilly uh yaron guitar that uh the, the bone model that's made out of mahogany uh sort of so he would take mahogany and route it all the way out the whole body so make it kind of hollow and then he would inlay that wood that i can't pronounce properly into the mahogany shell and then he put a maple top on that so now instead of having a heavier mahogany body he's got like a mahogany edge and mahogany back and it looks like mahogany but it's incredibly light with the other wood laid in the middle Gil, Gil like to kind of try things like that and um so the guitar almost sounds it's very resonant it almost sounds kind of hollow but there is a center block of that very light uh, wood that i can't pronounce so 
My Palona. All right. Uh, I'm late as usual. I was too, dude. Don't worry about it, Ian. I was very late. Like, really late today. Uh, but I figured better late than never, right? Uh, all right, all right, all right. You guys are arguing about uh, IRXs and Tonexes. Not arguing, just talking. I'd rather get an IRX than a Tonex. Different devices, but real tubes just can't be beat. By the way, folks, um, I believe the Chinese uh, Shuguang 12X7Bs are available again. Pretty great. So new production. Uh, you know, they, I think supposedly that fire or something at the factory and they haven't been available for a few years and COVID happened, supply chain, blah, 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 blah. All that kind of coincided into a perfect storm of tube unavailability. But I think those are back online now. And from what I hear, they're really good. And sound pretty much the same as good versions of the originals that are low noise and nice gain and the whole nine yards. So that's good news. Always good to have more tubes out there, right? Uh, uh, this is very nice. JJ says the Thornbucker 2 in my class guest has turned out to be the best upgrade. I've written five new tracks. That's amazing. That's awesome. So many have graded about the AT Magnet into the PT15 set. Right. It's all a balance, and that uh, A2 definitely warms things up, and the top end's lovely. And I'm glad you're happy. That's awesome. Good news. I'm glad it's helping you write. Greg says, uh, could you emulate power tube saturation with a few FX blocks in a helix? Um, well, I mean, I think the amps are sort of designed to do power tube saturation when you turn them up really loud, like if you crank the master. So you get an overall master, generally speaking, and I think it's just labeled volume, right, in a helix. Let me take a look. Just turn on the helix here. It's got a boot. Um, but I believe the control is volume, and then uh, and that's like patch volume. But then you get a master generally as well. If you turn that up on, say, like the JCM 800 models or something, I think it's supposed to emulate that already. Uh, so is that what you mean? Uh, let's take a look here. What have I got here? Um, just looking. Yeah, see, here in the match, like here's a matchless uh, model. It's got controls for drive, bass, cut, just like on a real matchless. I think it's supposed to be like a SC30 or whatever. Treble, there's a presence control. There's a channel volume. That's gonna be your overall on a Helix, the channel volume. It won't affect the tone, it'll just be the overall volume. And then there's a master. And so if you crank the master, you're gonna hear more distortion. Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, the, the, the differentiation between master and channel volume on a helix is the thing for sure. Uh, have you heard dark matter yet? Uh, which is the new album from Pearl Jam. I haven't. And I heard that there's also a dark matter from Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> uh, I haven't actually heard it yet. I heard that it was that they're going back to their punk rock roots or something. And I was reading a little bit about it, but I, I got to listen to it. Uh, here's a little bit about computers. My 2010 MacBook Pro is all but dead. SSD, plenty of memory and RAM. Don't run with old OS. Pain to transfer everything. So, yeah, that's what I find. And mine is a 2015. So I'm only five years ahead of you and on that path to dying as well. But I'm using it right now. So it still works for certain things. <laughs> Maybe I'll sell this computer or maybe I'll just take it home and use because I don't I don't have a desktop top computer at home. And I could actually probably I mean, I have a laptop, but it's kind of nice to have just at the desk and sit there. And so maybe I'll take this one home and buy a new Mac Studio, transfer everything over and spruce it up a little bit. I got to get things going around. Here. I got all kinds of issues. Like I said, plug in authorizations and things I need to take care of and get back into the flow of things here. I got to be honest. I mean, just a little aside, I, I've been on the road a lot. Uh, in the last six months, like I kind of left last August, uh, and well, I, I rehearsed in August and then I went out September and a lot of uh, September, October, kind of however much of that I did. And then I came back for a couple of weeks, left again for a couple of weeks in November. Then I was back for like five weeks. Um, and then I went on a classic rock show, but, but four or five weeks in December with Christmas and everything, it doesn't. It just feels like I've been on the road for six months. Like I don't, I feel like the time that I've spent here in this room, I've gotten a few videos done and some work and stuff like that, but I don't, 
it, it was never enough time to really get in the flow of being home. It's just quality problems. I've been having fun on the road and stuff, but I do feel like I'm wiped out right now, actually. And um, I need a little like recoup time and uh, and home time. I'm really excited to be home and going to go to the beach later and just like chill out and try and clear my head and stuff. And I've got I'm behind on a lot of stuff that I'm supposed to do around here. Um, videos and stuff like that. And there's just, you know, I've learned there's not enough time and I maybe bit off a little more than I could chew last year. That's what I think with the, the touring and maybe it's just my age or something, but I'm just feeling, I don't know, maybe some of you out there can relate, you know, FOMO or whatever. And then you just take on a lot. I just have taken on a lot and I'm a little like, gotta slow down, got to get into my you know, I cleaned up around the studio. I did some nice work around here. I've got all new cordial cable um, doing my whole my patch bay and my desk, my interface and all that stuff. But I need to kind of tighten up the studio scene still around here. My monitors developed. My, my barefoot's a little problem, so I'm sending those to get fixed. I'm fixing up around here and going to kind of tighten things up a little bit, clean up still. The, uh, even though the studio's looking pretty good right now, pretty, pretty organized. But going to get it better and then get my head in the game of, you know, writing and working on videos and stuff like that yes but also getting some new music recorded i'm really dead set on doing that i want to make a cool record really excited about uh doing something cool you know i got really inspired going to the uh the uh third man record plant in detroit and seeing them you know making all this great vinyl you know uh, projects of people you know there's literally like nine different stations of them producing you know, different records where they're, you know, and they, of course, do all the vinyl mastering and stuff like that. There's just very exciting. So I was like, God, I should do something. What if I did it all analog? Like went in a studio and, you know, made the effort to like, I don't even know if it's possible, but like or maybe just a, an analog EP or something or, or five songs or, but what if I did a whole album that way? Ooh, I don't know. You know, so I, I'm just trying to think of the possibilities. You know, and do do something, or maybe that's just biting off more than I than I need to, and I don't need to worry about recording everything analog from start to finish. Um, but I definitely, when I record again, I want to do uh, more live off the floor track, less overdubs, a little bit of overdubbing, but like almost like Van Halen sort of uh, aesthetic of like minimal overdubs and just. You know, I was just really excited about that. So uh, just trying to do something super live and killer and really uh, be my own worst critic and come up with something cool. Jen says, uh, I have a gear question. I uh, So I use my trustworthy Line 6 Relay G50 and from uh, uh, one day to the next, the wireless showed this red light audio through full signal. Nothing came out. Transmitter was fine. Uh, you know, I'm not sure, Jen. Um, I'm just going to say I've had a lot of issues with G50s and G30s and the G70 even. Um, and uh, I'm not, I'm like, I, I love Line 6 and I've had a good relationship with them, done all kinds of different stuff with them. That is not my favorite product. Uh, not to, you know, it's just not. So the one that I'm really sold on these days, to be honest, is the Sure GLXD, the 16 plus or whatever it's called. It's a little pedal board one. <clears throat> It works great as a tuner as well. So that's really nice because it takes care of having a tuner on your board. And um, just as far as the reception goes, I'm sure a lot of a lot of guys, that, like you guys talk about it in the chat, like if you've had any experiences with both the little Sure pedal board wireless as well as the, uh, the, the, the Line 6 relays and talk about it. But I, I, I had, I'm just saying because I, I um, tried them at numerous gigs and things. And I was on board from the beginning, by the way, because with the Line 6 wireless, because they bought it from X, uh, was it X Wire? Um, way back when I was playing with Christopher Cornell, I used to use these X Wire ones that were like little pedal board mounted wirelesses. And I was basically kind of like a guinea pig doing beta testing where I would have occasional dropouts and problems. They send me a new one with like a higher output pack or like they'd, they'd do a, a receiver with like big antennas mounted on the side that was kind of retrofitted and stuff for just, you know, like, what are, try this, does this work? <laughs> you know, and then they were trying to incorporate that stuff into the product. So I was kind of helping them like basically road test it and beta test it. Um, and uh, 
And then they sold to line six. So line six took it over. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. It's a bigger company and they'll have more resources and stuff. And it should be really good. Sure enough, the packs got sturdier. You know, they used to be kind of plastic and like not great with the, the X wire and the line six ones look really solid. And they were like made out of metal and just connectors and it made sense. I was like, this is going to be great. But I had a lot of dropouts, like a lot of problems with dropouts. And it bit me in the ass a couple of times. Like, a, like, you know, I remember once with Melissa Etheridge uh, at a casino gig and I had to go on a cable. It was like all of a sudden I was having all this interference. And, and then the other time was when I did that gig with Mitch Malloy in Florida. I took one out there that seemed to work fine here. And I was in the middle of a field in Destin, Florida. There's nothing around. It was just like not a, not a busy, you know, I was standing right on top of that thing and I couldn't get it to work. Uh, it, it would drop out a lot. And I ended up using for that show uh, a sure $299 analog wireless, just whatever somebody had there at the, and I went like, okay. And it wasn't great, but it was so much better than the, the other one reception wise. And it basically worked. I remember walking all the way to the end of this ramp they had at that show and stuff, and maybe starting to get a couple little crap outs, you know, but it at least was, I mean, it was the bottom line, sure analog one. That's what I used. Cause, and I thought, you dummy, why did you do this? You knew this years ago that this wireless, you know, I just didn't have good luck with them. Just didn't. And that's just me being honest. You know, sometimes people are like, you know, with guys like me, they're like, oh, they just talk about, you know, whatever. They just work from, for the companies and like whatever. And it's like, hey, I'll tell you if something, if I have a problem, especially if it bites me in the ass on a gig and I have a problem, I'm going to talk, I'll talk about it. Just because it's like, well, this was my experience. It didn't work. So anyway, that's a long ass winded dissertation about wireless. It's part of why I use the so I, I have very little problems with uh with Shures uh overall. And it's why I have the best wireless they make, which is the Axiom. Um it's incredible. And um I when I when you need to be able to travel from England to Asia to the US and play different Europe, you know, with different, uh, you know, all these different frequencies and rules and regulations everywhere. The, the Axiom is the only one that will work all over the world. So I got it. It's very expensive. But um, there are other wirelesses that work sort of more regionally. I mean, like I used to rent systems in Japan that I would use there. And we had huge stages and like really far from the receivers and stuff and uh, uh, you know with, with, like the gig i did in fuji in 2015 i felt like it was a quarter mile from the friggin' stage like to the end of the you know the, the ramp all the way out and i was like is this gonna work and it always worked it just worked it was like i would never get dropouts so i, I would use the big paddle antennas you know the ones that you see at big shows for uh for uh you know, the ones that they use for in-ears and stuff like that. And they're big on big stands and they look like paddles, big paddles. So on the tour I was just doing, I just had my axe, you know, with just the antennas, the regular ones mounted on the front. And there was one night where I went out in the crowd and I went back pretty far. Like, you know, probably I was at least 200 feet from the stage or something like that. And my because of the configuration of the stage that night, I didn't have direct sight to the antennas my rack was uh, off to the side of the stage because of it was a small stage and we, we just I just have too much stuff sometimes I couldn't have my rack facing me and the antennas right at the front so anyways long story short I did start to hear a little bit of when I, I recognize what it sounds like now uh when it's crapping out or you're getting a little bit of interference but the sure masks it really well it doesn't you don't get complete audio dropouts you get kind of these little glitches that's almost like it's almost like the audio equivalent of like pixelation in a video, but the video is still playing. <laughs> it just doesn't sound quite right all of a sudden. And it kind of masks it and does something. And it's kind of rad. It's like, well, it's still working, but I better go back towards those antennas. Now you can tell, you know, I could hear it in my in ears. Um, so, but that's, that's to be expected. I mean, even with an axion, if you're not using the paddles, if you're using the paddles, it'll increase your range, like pretty dramatically, I think so. Oh, some stuff about wireless there. But yeah, Jen, I would just recommend going sure GLXD uh, 16 plus, to be honest. That's that's my, I just, I, I, I kind of gave up, you know, and because I got bit in the butt a couple of times and I didn't like that. I don't, I, I don't like that on gigs and stuff. 
I, my main thing is I just want shit to work. You know, that's my thing. I want things to work when I use them live. I don't want problems. I don't like, you know, uh, I like reliable stuff that just, and if I don't have good luck, I'm going to be like, yeah, I don't recommend using that. It's Jules from Holland, not Jules Holland, but Jules from Holland. And you say, hello, what's up, man? How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Can you plug, uh, uh, to a very act to a small portable tube amp? Sure. You could very act anything. Um, whether or not it makes it sound better or what, you know, it just depends. But, you know, uh, that small portable tube amp, it, one thing you're going to want to do is, um, unless it's cathode bias, but you're going to want to bias it. Uh, I find to get the best out of a Variac, you have to bias for the lower voltage. So a lot of people, you know, Eddie, oh, Variac, 90 volts, just turn it down, sounds better. But a lot of people will do that to their, their, uh, the ramps but they won't go through the step of you know biasing it for the low because as you're lowering that voltage you're going to find the bias changes and you need so whatever you know like if it, if a marshall sounds best at you know whatever 35 millivolts or whatever you like to set your tubes up you're going to find all of a sudden it's oh they're at like i don't know what like 18 or something or 20 when you drop the voltage down to 90. so um it's best to get in there with the bias pot and just crank the voltage back up so that it's up above 30 a little bit, you know, and, and uh, that's with a Marshall. So with your amp, I'm not sure. Uh, you'd have to look at, you know, specs and what the manufacturer recommends the bias be set at. Uh, and, and I would always bias for the, the different voltage. Now, of course, that means if you turn the voltage back up to 120, you've got to rebias before you, you know, power up that, you know, you, you, so... Each, each time you change the voltage, you should bias for the, the, that voltage. And then it's, it could sound kind of cool. But it's not going to work on every amp either, you know. Like, for whatever reason, it sounds good on an old Marshall. Um, and you might find that, you know, one reason to use a Variac on an older amp is that, you know, those amps were made for 110, I think, which is kind of what the brown box does. You, ever, you guys ever see that thing called the brown box? It just, it just lowers the voltage a little bit. Um, because these old Marshalls and stuff for US spec ones weren't made for 120. They were made for like 110, I guess. So uh, it's, you know, they're a little happier, I think, and maybe sound a little sweeter running at the, the other voltage at, at like 110. So that's, a, that's another thing about Variax. Uh, can actually be a, a good thing for older tube amps from that perspective, rather than just the, you know, dialing down to 90 thing what about just dialing from 120 down to 110. um julian says it's been a minute you look well thanks i feel pretty good i'm a little burned out but uh i'm gonna take the rest of the day off after i do this today it's just been kind of, it's been hectic man and i mean i flew back from new york and just kind of hit the ground running yesterday and ended up at the show last night and uh, which was brilliant the um for those just joining, I was at the Maynard Keenan 60th anniversary or 60th anniversary, 60th birthday party uh, last night at the Hollywood Bowl, and it was God, what a what a great venue the Hollywood Bowl is too. We're so lucky, and uh, I mean, different countries, obviously, you know, uh, you know, England's got Wembley, and uh, you know, different countries. I mean, France is full of I mean, Roman era, you know, um, you know, beautiful, you know theater venues and um but but la has the hollywood bowl sometimes i bitch about venues in la that there's not enough cool you know because there's some great clubs and stuff across this country and great kind of mid-sized venues and concert venues but la does have the hollywood bowl and it's a pretty special place to see a show pretty awesome so i was really appreciating being there for that show last night and seeing uh all that great uh music from a perfect circle and Pussifer and primus and then a little bit from tool right at the end it was awesome have you played live with the quad cortex says alan i have yeah i thought it was too fragile mm, no i mean it's fragile how like uh just the screen or something i've, I've used it on tour with fight for fighting i used it on a whole summer tour last year with no problems um a month and the year before that i was out for a almost a month with them three weeks or something um so that's the extent of my touring with it uh i've done some one-offs with it as well other gigs but yeah i've taken it on the road on a pedal board and use it as my main tone source so um people do make third-party covers and things for the screen that you can put over the touch screen and it kind of flips up then 
um, that'll protect it from you know liquid or anything flying up the thing. Um, I never had a problem with the switches or any of that stuff. I mean, it seems good. So uh, I've I've heard of you know a few like one-off kind of problems, things like people having to uh, you know send them in for repair or for you know this issue or that issue, different things. But um, for the most part, I mean that's that's any piece of gear, I guess you know. Uh, there's a super chat I gotta grab there. Uh, and I'm pretty far back in the chat, so I'm gonna move down. Great to see you all. There's almost 350 people online. It's nice you guys come back and see me. I mean, I know it's inconsistent sometimes with the time, and it's been a little crazy all over the map. So thanks for sticking with me and uh, working around my my idiosyncrasies as a human being. Uh, love your content, says David. Dave Davis. I Davisid. Davisid. <laughs> Thank you, man. Uh, having a hard time trying to decode the tone of a song, the settings for the delay and distortion. Can you help me? Intro of Mirror of the Heart by Sammy Bowler. I could just ask Sammy. Uh, maybe I'll try and do that this week. Um, let me take a picture of the screen so that I remember the name of the song and everything. And um, Sammy is uh, good friends with Dave Friedman, and Dave talks to him all the time. So maybe I'll just have Dave text him and say, hey, dude, maybe I have Sammy's number. I don't even remember uh let me see Sammy. no i don't but i could get it from dave or, or i'll just have dave text him uh yeah uh let's we got here let's see Let's see. What are you guys talking about? Have you uh, compared the Thornbucker to the Bare Knuckle Mule? They seem similar. No, I know they are kind of, uh, they're both A4 and a similar strength, but I've never directly compared them. I have tried the Bare Knuckle VH2, though, and that's a that's a nice sounding pickup. Really, really, really good uh, uh, sounding pickup. So way back when I did the, you can hear me uh, using it uh, in the, EVH pickup video where we compared like I think 23 different pickups um, and uh, so bare knuckle I also have a set of the rebel yells in my in my nags that's what came in it and they sound great because uh, it's the uh, uh, Steve Stevens model that's what I was trying to say God, my mind's not working today I'll get back in the swing here need some more rest Slept like crap last night. I think I ate some ch uh, chocolate covered espresso beans last night, like kind of close to bedtime. <laughs> I probably wasn't the smartest thing to do, but I found them in my pocket because I bought them in the airport the other day. And I was like, ooh, these seem delicious right now. And I think they screwed me up. I think I was like heart palpitations at about five in the morning. Yeah. So that was, that was dumb. I don't know what I was thinking. I wasn't thinking. Uh, does Plexi style amp? Uh, sorry, I I, high, I highlight a message there saying that uh, it was the fellow left me super chat. Um, uh, he said his message got cut off, but I think I understood it. Uh, I want to thank Pete for its content or my content. I guess. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, does a Plexi style amp need to be single channel to get the famed roar? Is it just SL67 and Plex amps that can do this? Uh, you know, um. I think there's a few out there. I mean, one of my goals with the PT50 is to bring you that on, you know, the, the overdrive side, if you want that plexi thing in a channel switcher to be able to do that, that it's basically kind of that sound. So i um, going to kind of bring you that. The, the closest thing I've heard to that that's out now is probably Friedman's uh, small box, where the plexi channel really is just a plexi circuit with a master. So it's kind of like a JCM 800, but without the extra cold gain stage. Um, it's, it's basically a plexi, you know, on that. And so if you crank the master way up and then you just bring the gain up, it kind of sounds like, I mean, I know Dave's done AB, you know, on amp switchers with his old 68 plexi and he feels like it's very, very, very close, like the small box plexi channel compared to the, the real 68 plexi. So, so you know, I, th I think it's possible. Um, it's just a lot of the amps out there that have more than one channel. A, a plexi can sound pretty anemic uh, without, when you put a master on it, it just neuters it a little bit. I mean, you can always open up the master. The question is how transparent is that master, you know? So, uh, but 
you know, a, a plexi just when you when you take the Ingve said it best in the video that he did with Rick Beato. I thought it was great where he said the gain is linear throughout the amp. And I really like that description of how in the preamp and kind of the, you know, the phase inverter and then the power section and all that sort of helps generate the sound of a plexi. And when you change any one thing, it sort of changes what we like about that amp and the equation that unfortunately you can't seem to get without volume and cranking it up. So if you put a master on it, it's sort of now you're, you know, a little bit of neutering going on. Um, especially if it's the pre-phase inverter master and you're backing that down. Now you're not hitting the phase inverter hard. It's a big part of the sound of that amp. So, but the the small box does seem to get you there when you just crank the master. You know, it seems like it works pretty well. So that's a good one. And I, that's what I want to do in my next amp, you know, not to give it all away, but in a PT50, I would like to be able to achieve that on the channel too. Like, yeah, basically it sounds as rocking as an SL67, uh, you know, set in a similar way. So um it, it might render the other channels kind of not unusable but like you know if you're going to open the master way up on one of the channels to get kind of a crunch sound out of the phase inverter stuff well now you're kind of painting yourself into a corner with the lead channel as well as maybe the clean channel kind of like but if you're recording you, you don't even need the channel switching you know then maybe it doesn't matter you know i just want to be able to get like yeah set the amp like this and it'll basically do that thing you know um that an SL67 or 68 or Marshall JMP or whatever will, will do you, uh, you know, if, if that's what you want to do, you can get there with that amp. Um, does that make sense? I hope so. So uh, if you design your own Les Paul, would you go for ABR1 or Raptail? Ooh, that's a great question. There's different, I'd probably go ABR1, but there is the Raptail, like, is it better? Is it, I'd, I would want to try <laughs> two of the same guitar. Like, I'd be like, let's build prototypes with a, you know, a, a, a 54 style, you know, wrap tail and then also an AVR1 and let's listen, you know, and let's try and do the exact same weight bodies. And that's what I would want to do, to be honest, just because I've never really directly gotten to compare that kind of stuff. So yeah, then you can get into like, I've got two Gillian guitars and one of them's got a um, less angle, like the bridge is lower and the, the, the neck angle and the body is more like a 54 or 55. And then they changed it around then and there was more. The, the, the neck on the later 50s Les Pauls was angled more. And so the bridge was a little higher and different things, you know. So it's, it's, it's just kind of interesting. All that stuff, like which, which neck angle do you go for? All that good stuff. Um, so um, Dwayne says, dude, every time you touch a guitar, the tone sounds great. I can't even focus on the technique. You, you're really nice, man. Thank you. Appreciate that. You got to play poorly once in a while. Um, I hate playing poorly, though. It makes me feel bad. <laughs> I appreciate the compliment though. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is the JTM in the back a new addition? No, I did a video for that amp a little while ago. Once I opened up, started doing videos for amps, uh, Marshall had me do that. So that's that's been there for a while. You can see a video on my channel for that amp. And it, it's really quite a good sounding amp. And I like that cabinet too. Does the JTM 45 thing nicely. The Mac Studio Pro would be good for you. Oh, yes, it was only an M4. M4 processor. Oh, no, not yet, but 2025. Good platform for the home studio. I don't think I need, like, even that. You know, like, I mean, I'm never recording more than a few tracks at a time at tops. So, like, uh, you know, Macs that were out in 2010 were fully capable of dealing with my... <laughs> I, I remember people saying, like, uh, uh, that for audio basically it's almost become like word processing was like it's like it's computers are fast enough many like 15 years ago they were fast enough to handle just kind of almost close to unlimited track counts and stuff like that you know so uh it's more of the video stuff that is uh taxing on computers i guess now like you know when you're streaming multiple uh you know 4k videos and trying to edit them all in a in Final Cut Pro or whatever, and you've got multiple camera angles with 4K streaming from four different, you know, it's that tends to be taxing. So, uh, yeah. How many musicians and vocalists travel on the CRS tour? Um, I always forget. So there's three main singers, uh, and then it's two guitars, bass, drums, keys. How many is that? Five, six, seven, eight people, I guess, on stage. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you 
guys talking about seven strings. I've never had a seven string guitar. I'm more interested in baritones, to be honest, for that kind of low thing. Like I love a baritone long scale, you know, my Dano or whatever. I would love a baritone sir. Like I'd like a high tech kind of baritone guitar. That'd be pretty cool. Like uh so maybe one of these days I'll try and uh try and figure that out. But uh Julian says it's not your age, it's how much you give, the amount you give. Yeah. Um, well, you know, to a certain degree. I mean, I think when you get older, you just kind of tend to slow down a little more too. But yeah. Uh, for sure, if you're, you know, constantly outputting all the time, it's, you know, it's, it's taxing, I guess, on your, you know, you've only got so much gas in the tank, right? Um, it's important to recharge. My sure, my sure PT standard HH is my number one. Awesome. So versatile. I particularly love the slim C neck. I'm interested in getting the HSS, but curious how different the new neck is. It's a little different, but I think it's, um very nice so it's quite close to here's my hh right here this is my one that i kind of my my main that i always fall back on my garnet red one i love this guitar i played it on some videos recently and it reminded me why i love it so much the red back or the red top and black back and everything so much fun um but i'm very very comfortable going from this neck to my I mean, you know, I can't speak for everybody out there, but for going from this neck to the the uh, HSS version is not a huge. I mean, it, the HSS has this little subtle down low V thing that some people say they can't even feel, so it's that subtle. But I feel it. Um, it's a slightly wider neck, so the nut is a little wider, and there's a little more meat, which a lot of people seem to dig because they, you know, some people seem to think the neck on this guitar is a little small i don't find it small at all if you're used to playing like an american standard strat this is going to feel very comfortable um it's not like a 60s strat but it is more like a like a modern you know 22 fret strat c anything from the last 20 years it's not far off from a neck like that at all and then just with like meticulous frets and the whole nine yards so um the the, the new one i haven't heard anybody say they don't like uh and I haven't heard people say, oh, it's so different either, like going from one to the other, you know. So I think you would be, if 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 you like one, I think you'd probably get used to the other. I like different necks. A I mean, I don't, uh, I don't need all my guitars to feel the same anymore. You know, it doesn't bother me. I kind of appreciate them for what they, uh, they do. So uh, anyways, um. Just looking through your, your comments here. Uh, do you have a favorite third man location between the London? So I've been to the London one. Uh, and I've never been to the Nashville one. Uh, and I've been to the Detroit one. So, but the, I don't remember the London one having vinyl, um, like pressing plant there. You know, the, the, the Detroit one was amazing because it had the big plant in the back and you could look through the window and see the records being made. Uh, so that was pretty cool. So I guess I'll pick that one if I have to pick a favorite. The London one's cool. It's in Soho, but it's just like a sh uh, shop. It's just a store, right? So, which is cool too, but they sell neat stuff. Um, did you make a video of Third Man? You know, I think I did actually. I, I could probably like hold it up to the, let me see. Um, let me see here. Let's see if I can find it. Because it was pretty neat. Detroit. Just putting Detroit in my in my phone and see what pops up. Uh, Detroit. Let's see. Detroit. See all. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Uh, where's the third man video? Uh, I'm not seeing it right now. Pop up. It's lame. Sometimes when I search in my iPhone, it's like, well, it's not everything I took. I took pictures of Third Man, and they're not they're not showing up in my. But I guess if I was to let's see, March twenty. I guess it was March twenty eighth. I was there. One sec, March 
28th, 2024. Now, all the stuff that I did on that day. There it is. I think. Well, there's a shot from the, the that's the store, I think. Isn't it? Yeah. It's like in the store. Uh, is this video? Well, that's a photo of the record pressing plant. Um, it's really big though. It's like giant size. I don't see a video in my feed, right? I don't. Sometimes when you search for things, it doesn't all pop up or it's not, it's not showing me the video. But anyway, that's just a little photo of one corner of the plant because it was a great big room and you could watch the guys in there, you know, making the, you know, it was neat. Watch them, watch them do that. Um, let's see. Here is a super chat. Just a little uh, uh, than you, uh, or I think for you or something, uh, for all your advice and inspiration throughout the years from Agent Black Crow somewhere in Europe. Thank you. Appreciate that for the super chat. By the way, I spotted the THG hot plate on your coffee table a few videos back. What are your thoughts? I needed it for something. Um, I don't even remember what. I wanted to, I was comparing uh, loads for a reason and, and attenuators. Uh, you know, it's okay, the THD hot plate. Um, it was never my favorite, but a lot of people like them. I know Paul Gilbert used them, for example. Um, you know, they, they do the job and they do sound uh, decent for the money and they're readily available. And I think that they provide a safe load for the amplifier. And there's a lot of good things about them. They're, they always dull the sound a little bit to me, but maybe it's a good thing with your sound. Maybe you need a little less high end, you know? There's the switches on them for the kind of lows and highs, but they don't, it doesn't do kind of exactly what a, you know, like when you don't have the amp loaded sort of thing, you know, it's it's not quite the same sound, but it, it, I think it, it was a good piece of gear that solved a lot of problems for a lot of working guitar players, the hot plate, um, readily available, well-made, you know, I like THD stuff. I still have a THD uh, Flexi 50 amplifier. I should bust that out one of these days and and but and plug it in and do something with it because i remember it sounding really good and i remember it got great this is a 20 25 year old amplifier now i remember it got great reviews when it came out um and it was designed to work with any output tube so you could kind of try different tubes in it and easily bias and stuff and um so you know i used to put some wacky tubes in that thing i had like a pair of old eel 37s ever heard of those <laughs> probably not and i used to put those in it and see what those sounded like and i still have those tubes somewhere but anyway, I, I always really liked uh, some of the amps that, you know, that I heard from THD back in the day. They were one of the original boutique amp uh, companies. And, and I, I feel like the hot plate for today, at least, was a good product, you know, and, and was helpful for a lot of guitar players. I mean, you could take an old Marshall to a gig and kind of set it on minus eight, right? And the, the, the dB reduction and, and you'd be just fine, you know, then it was kind of like a reasonable volume for a club. Might not be the exact same sound as running it wide open be a little more midi and a little closed down in the top end but it worked and it allowed you to use your amp and clubs and stuff so it's pretty cool karen says will you use live drums most definitely on a new record yeah i've got a lot of great drummer friends that within spitting distance of where i am right now that have studios and so you know would be my intention to probably do some live drums with them uh you know one of their places and uh, but maybe just the other thing is maybe just go to a studio, a really good studio and do like drums and bass and basic guitars on at least like, maybe I don't have to do the whole record that way, but maybe I could do five songs like that or six and do like a 10 song album, you know, and do like, you know, a few of them kind of more experimental or an acoustic song or something like I did on Pete Thorne too, but have a five or six tunes that were really just raw cool old school well recorded great engineering great guitar tones um with minimal overdubs and just kind of lean you know kind of what i want to do i feel like the world could use it yeah yeah uh, Murray says, my Line 6 wireless just stopped working like that. Too weird. The sure one is great. Murray says, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people, like Jared says, I've got a G50, no issues so far. I've heard that from a lot of folks. They just, you know, they didn't have issues. And 
I just did a lot, you know, maybe it was just where I was playing or I got really unlucky. You know, Friedman always says that if stuff's going to go wrong, it's going to be for you <laughs> with your gear because things always seem to break for me, you know, but um, anyways, do you have any tips for playing acoustics live, pedals, DI? Uh, but, you know, I use Taylor's and that's an endorsement. And I, without hesitation, I like Taylor guitars. I like the pickup system, just the little three knobber. Uh, you know, it's a volume, a bass, and a treble. It was designed by Neve or something, I think, back in the day. It's been out for a long time. I find they sound really good, really consistent. We were just using them on the road. Um, you know, at one point we played Wish You Were Here, and I had a 12 string, and the other two guys had six strings, and we had three Taylors up there on stage, all with the same that same pickup system. I thought it sounded great in the PA. Um, so I like those. I don't use anything special. I was running into, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if it was a radial DI, maybe, um, for this tour, but just a good DI. You know, it was an active, was it active or passive? I can't even remember. But it was a, one of those blue ones, you know, it's like a, sits a it's kind of big DI. I don't know what the hell it was. I think it, that's, this is how much time and effort I put into it. Because what I do is when I play acoustic, First of all, I don't play a ton of acoustic live, so I'm not like super like the guy to maybe ask, but I play acoustic on a couple songs or a few songs usually, like with the current band and with, with Five for Fighting, I'll play acoustic on one song, you know? And so what I'll tend to do is um, run my uh, same rig that I use for, so like my, tu my wireless, my tuner and everything, because my switcher has two outputs on it, my, my Musicom Lab switcher. So one output feeds, my amp and you know so i'm plugging wireless basically into my pedal board which goes into my my music on lab switcher with a whole bunch of pedals and stuff in the loops and all that stuff and my tuner and all that stuff right well then it's got two outputs a and b the a side goes to the front end of my amp the b side goes out of di that or just kicks out a quarter inch output out the side of my pedal board and that goes to the di for acoustic so i can use the same tuner and everything for my acoustic so i don't have a special di on my pedal board or anything it's always whatever the pa company supplies i guess i am kind of running through you know my tuner and everything that's on my board um that's just kind of the way i've always done it so and it, it seems to work so yeah I don't, I don't i don't do anything special like i sort of leave it up to the the front of house to do all the compression and eqing anytime you do that stuff I guess if you really got into it, which I never do, uh, but if you really got into it, like compressing and EQing your guitar, maybe you could get it to sound great going through the front of house before it even hits there. Generally, when I try and do that stuff, like I add compression or anything to the guitar, the front of house engineer always goes, have you got compression on? <laughs> and I'll go, yeah, a little bit. And I'll go, can you take that off and I'll just do it here? And I'm like, that seems to make sense because it's like, you know, in a big PA and they, they got a better, you know, whatever they got at front of house, they can maybe handle it better than I can. So it's funny though, cause I was talking to, um, our, our, our front of house guy the other day, uh, Pete, and he, he does sound for a few different artists. And he was saying that sometimes he even does effects on electric guitars and stuff for them at front of house. That's not a thing I've ever done, but he'll be like, yeah, I'll do the delays and the time-based stuff on certain songs at front of house for, and he goes that we've you know certain gigs he's done for different artists and he's like we've gotten into a really good rapport with it and i know exactly the right delay times for certain songs and the mix and everything and then the guitar player just has to use you know maybe you know a guitar and an overdrive and a wah and an amp or something and then the, the the front of house is doing all that you know that i could see that working that's kind of more studio style then uh so all right getting long-winded um let's see Karen's asking a question about the uh, JHS Muffaletta. Is that like a big muff style? Into Iridium. Wanted the pedal to be louder when kicked in. Could not achieve that pedal on 12 with cleanish Iridium. Um, I guess it just depends on the output of the... Of the I mean, some drives and fuzzes, they just don't really... They, you know, a lot of like a fuzz face to me always seems like, man, the output, unless you crank it, like with the volume on an, on a fuzz face, it seems like they're, they're, they lower the output a little bit. So it just depends on the particular pedal, um, you know, like getting a lift over top of you, you know, one, another thing you got to remember when you're running something like an Iridium is that it's got a, there might be some 
limiting or something. I don't know, but they're like, I'm not saying there is, but I'm saying that what there is is an A to D, an analog to digital converter on an Iridium, because if you're plugging your guitar into it, then it's going into digital land pretty quickly, right? Well, you can't go past zero going into it or you're going to clip. So if you've got a fairly loud guitar, humbucker, let's say it's a Les Paul or something, fairly loud guitar going into, you've, you've got a limited dynamic range there anyway. So now if you kick it with a fuzz or something that's super square wave and maybe louder going into the front of the Iridium, you're in danger at some point of clipping. Maybe they built in some sort of protection circuit or something and it sounds like the level's dropping a little bit when you're, I'm not saying that that's, but it's possible, like, you know, that they've done that in order, because sometimes I wonder about that with like digital modelers and pedals and things like that. Like, um, you know, companies like Line 6 or, uh, or you know, Strymon with the Iridium, they, they've got a, a figure that, you know, somebody might plug a, a Music Man bass that's got active electronics and super high output. You know, they can be 20 dB louder or something than a, than a Strat or a Tele with like weaker pickups, you know? A Strat with like, you know, low output 50 style single coils compared to like a Music Man bass with bass and treble controls and a, and a hot preamp in it that can kick the hell out of the front end of an amp. Um, they've got to take all that into account when they're making these, these modeler pedals that convert to digital. So what do they do? Maybe there's some sort of protection on the front end of the circuit. Maybe you, maybe you ran into that. I'm not saying there is, I don't know, but, but it's, it's possible. Right. So anyways, uh, <laughs> there's a YouTube video of a producer doing a project to tape through a Neve console for the first time. He said it was a pain in the ass. Well, it, it, is it a new producer <laughs> that's never done it? So when you're saying they've never done it before, you know, here's the thing. It's like there's some engineers and producers that it's just, I, I, when I started recording, it was all analog, you know? I mean, literally the machine that I used to record on was an Akai 1214. When I first started in the early 90s, 90, 91, 92, um, uh, I was in this band in LA and we were working on a 1214, which was recorded on beta tape. And it was an analog machine that recorded on what looked like videotape, like beta videotape. And you put it in, it had a built-in mixer, this thing. And um, you had to clean the heads and demagnetize those heads like every half an hour. I swear to God, you'd have to take the tape out, clean the heads with alcohol or whatever we used and demag and the whole nine yards or, or you were losing tracks and fidelity like crazy because that tape would shed all over the heads all the time. Um, when I used to record, I mean, I actually got to the point where, you know, I, I engineered a session. I remember one time uh, where I got hired as an engineer at my friend's studio. And I ran the, was it Amp, Ampex or Amperex or whatever, uh, 12, 12, uh, 1200, 24 track. And I knew how to, back then, I knew how to clean the heads and demag and do all this, uh, do all the stuff that I had to do and even cut tape and edit and stuff like that, you know? And he had an old uh, Allen and Heath, like kind of decent, not great console, but it was okay. And, um, yeah, it was like, I, I could do that stuff back then. And it was like, yeah, I remember. I mean, sure, you could only do three songs on a reel. Each, you know, a 24-track reel was 15 minutes. So you'd have to, you know, and tape was expensive and still is and stuff. Of course, it's a pain in the ass, but it's cool, you know. I mean, just waiting for the, you know, you do a take and you're waiting for it to rewind. <laughs> it's not all these things that we've gotten used to these days, you know. But my point with the, the uh, talking about doing an album, maybe, you know, like what, like actually making LPs was that it would be neat to record an album that never hits digital. You know, my friend yesterday, John, he was like, oh yeah, but do it and record all with Axfexes. <laughs> record all analog on analog tape and everything, but do it all with digital modelers. He's like, no, but um, yeah, anyways, uh, the, just my point being that what if it, what if it never hit digital? You know, what if it was all analog? Um, all the way down to when the needle plays on the finished product, you know, kind of cool. Probably won't do that. It seems like a pain in the ass, but uh, Ian says, can I be a backup singer <laughs> on your new album? Uh, I don't generally have backup vocals on my albums. I don't generally have any vocals. Uh, not saying that I won't, but you never know. All right, 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 all right. What else we got here? Uh, do you find that players are using less wireless these days and going cabled? A trend? No, I don't 
really see that trend. I mean, I think that certain players, it makes sense to use cables and for other ones, it makes sense to go wireless and it'll probably always kind of be that way. But I see a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of high quality wireless these days that aren't, isn't that expensive. So, um, you know, the Shures and, you know, other offerings from Sennheiser and stuff like that. So, so if you want to jump around on stage, I mean, there's no way I could do the band that I play in right now and be nearly as active as I am on our stage with a cable. First of all, our stage is littered with crap. <laughs> there's lights everywhere. There's floor lights. There's a lot of cables and like stuff already for all the lights and things that are all over the place. There's multiple, I've got two wedges um my pedal board there's a wedge in the middle now for rudy one of the singers uh, jane has a wedge i mean there's a lot of stuff to nav navigate on our stage um and things to step over and not trip on and things like that so if you've got a cable and it's getting wrapped around uh, multiple singers with mic stands all over the place and it's just like there's no way uh so for me wireless is great i i do remember though like the first tour i ever did with the, these guys i played a hendrix song and i wanted a fuzz face and i you can't do that with wireless because of the the uh, impedance issue and the germanium and all that or whatever this certain circuit of a, of a fuss and the roll down i wanted all that so i would go to a cable for that and you know occasionally where i've had issues too where the wireless is i mean it's very rare but you know i've always got a cable ready to go in case i gotta plug in with the cable but it will severely hamper my ability to run around um Jack's guitar says it's the 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi range that is very unreliable for wireless systems, which over the years has gotten even less reliable. So that's what both Line 6 and Shure use. But the Shure also uses something like the 5 gigahertz range. I know that it can pick. It can go between 2.4 and 5 on the new GLXD, uh, GLX, what is it, 16D, I think it's called. Anyway, you'll find it on the Sweetwater website. If you go there, or Toman, wherever you shop, but um, yeah, it's got uh, ability to go between two two point four and five, and so it tends to work really well. I don't know; I just don't have that many problems with it. I've used it live, and it and it, it seems to work really well. And that's what most people report as well. I don't know, man. Sure, makes great wireless. I'm big fan. I'm just big fan. It just works. I like shit that works. <laughs> that's what I like. That's what I like. I like it when it works so that I can do my job. We all go home happy. Uh, yeah. I'm on the hunt for a PV Classic 50 head. Those were cool. Um, for, or is it, no, eight EL84s, right? In those, a lot of EL84s, but neat. Eight? Is that right? I think so. Wait, wait, was the PV Classic 58 EL84? I can't be. Maybe it was. I don't remember, to be honest. Uh, I want to know now. See, this is my mind. Full of silly, trivial information. PV Classic 50 head. There's one. There's one on reverb right now. Uh... Let's check it out. Oh, no, it says, don't have any listings for this now. So it must not be there anymore. Made in the 2000s. Tweed. I mean, I remember them well. I, I just don't remember exactly what tubes were in them. Um, it was a nice sounding uh, amp, though. Uh, you know what's the little sleeper, too? It's just, I'm going to say it. I, even though I shouldn't, but the classic 20, the original one was killer. Killer, killer. I think the tone on Alive by Pearl Jam at the beginning is maybe a classic 50. That's what I heard. You know, that, that riff. I'm pretty sure that that's a, a classic 50. I don't know if it was the 410 or the 212 or what the heck it was. All right, here's a picture of the back of a classic 50 head. Eel 84, four, four. Oh, I remember, I remember. It, they had a, a classic 100 that was eight. That's what it was. That's what I'm thinking, why eight? Because it was like, wait a minute, what? But yeah, somehow I think it was class AB with the four Eel 84s and they got 50 watts out of four Eel 84s in a kind of, kind of interesting tube choice for a 50 watt amp. Class AB, not the usual. 
Anyways, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. There's a picture of a classic 50. It's no longer available. It was at Clown City Music, and it's gone now. But uh, I, I, I don't set those amps sound pretty darn good as well. I do. Um, yeah. Uh, did you ever get in a bad company? A little bit, yeah. I've uh, been listening quite a lot lately. Mick Ralph seems to have quite a unique guitar tone, even though supposedly he used Marshalls. Well, you never know what they were, you know, maybe he was using Altex or like, you know, weird mics or, you know, strange. So much uh, uh, in the uh, in the equation when it comes to guitar sounds. But yeah, um, Paul Rogers, man. Uh, the, the Greek is nice too, says Karen. Speaking of theaters in LA, Hollywood Bowl, Greek theater. I think I'm pretty far back in the chat. I gotta, I gotta move down. I got some super chats to grab here and stuff um a greek is great it's a really nice theater in la uh that's in los Feliz, the greek theater beautiful amphitheater great vibe um i i only problem i have with it is the volume limit because it's quite low it's a 98 db and it's really regulated and they're hardcore so you might find yourself going to see a show there and going like turn it up like it's so the difference between 98 and 100 is just big when you're watching the show it's like 100 sounds great it's like man, it's powerful. I can still talk to my friend sitting beside me. It's not too loud, but it's like, yeah, that's a rock show. And that's kind of probably what I was hearing last night. I want to say around 100 at the Hollywood Bowl, because there's a limit there too. But the Greek is 98, and it's they're militant about it. Great big meter at the soundboard, you'll see, that's flashing the probably A-weighted, you know, 98 dB. And if you go over, they'll, they'll yell at you. Uh, Sir fan says, wait, uh, what show with Perfect Circle, Primus, and Tool? Last night at the Hollywood Bowl, it was uh, Maynard's 60th birthday. So all his friends were there from all his bands. <laughs> Primus and uh, as well. And they, uh, they put on an amazing show last night where he just played basically songs with all those folks. I mean, it was incredible. It was a really great show. Really great show. There's a video on my Instagram if you, if you want to watch it. Um, perfect circle sitting there on the couch <laughs> up on the riser by the drums you know by danny carey playing drums and tool playing and perfect all of perfect circles watching tool play it's really cool uh so great um haven't been able to make any in-ear monitors sound good are you liking yours do you have any tricks um yeah so i you know um a lot of it is down to the monitor person um I started using my A5s, which are an old discontinued set of uh, um, 64 years. They, I think A6s is what they make now, six, six driver instead of five, but probably similar. But um, I, I was using my, for part of the tour, I was using ASI. Uh, and then I, I tried the A5s and just adding some audience mics in. So we have a couple of mics on either side of the stage facing out at the crowd so I can get some of the crowd feel and ambience in my ears. And I, I actually, uh, like the ASIs have the microphones built in. I've talked about them a lot. They work really great. I really like them. But the audio of the, the A5s, like I, I was starting to really dig the sound in the A5s. Um, the tone of the bass and the guitars and the way the cymbals sounded and everything just sounded really good. And then when I had, I was getting more of the audience mics than I've tried in the past and it sounded really good to me. And I went, you know what, I'm going to go with this for the remainder of the tour, which was the back half of the tour. So I ended up on the A fives and blending in the audience mic. So all I can say is getting a great mix in your ears is important where, you know, things like the, your microphone microphone position on your guitar amp is going to become quite important. Or if you're using IRs or modeler, picking that carefully so that you like it and it also sounds good in the front of the house, you know, it's all very important. And then what seemed to make it work for me was adding a bit more audience mics. It does tend to make things a little whooshier and more diffuse and all that, because of course you've got two microphones facing away from the stage out at the audience. But that gave me a bit more realism in my ears and I, I, by the end i was kind of enjoying it now uh, we got this new sound guy pete who's amazing and i love it it's quite loud though our show has been quite loud and i, I don't have a problem with that i think it sounds amazing um like it's been awesome and he's i wouldn't have changed a thing actually it was so cool and the guitars sound great and the pa very happy but i was getting a little ear fatigued by the end of you know playing four nights in a row or whatever and all the gigs and everything so it was like i put in my ears quite a bit 
uh, throughout the show, or at least towards the end of the show. And the effect is always not as fun. I mean, it's like it kills the fun vibe a little bit, you know. Um, it's just never. I still feel the same way as I did 20 years ago. Like, as, if if it's perfect, you got a great mix. Everything sounds clear. I can hear myself. I can hear everyone. It's awesome. It always sounds like, wow, that's a really good sound. Quite nice. Sounds good. As soon as I pull out the ears, it's very exciting. <laughs> you know, the sound of the crowd, the audience, the guitars echoing off everywhere, and just like all that. It's a different effect, and I, I don't think I'll ever change the way I feel about that. You know, it's just impossible. Um, it just has to do with the psychoacoustic hearing everything from all the, you know, and the volume and the, like, it's just, there's no but beating your ears up at the same time. So there's no perfect, there's nothing perfect, you know, um, but never been able to make them sound good. I would say it starts with a good set of ears that aren't too low endy. You know, I can recommend the 64s uh, as if you want to get a set of, you know, or maybe just a UE 11s, something like that, you know, that aren't crazy money, but they aren't the super cheap ones either. And then trying to, uh, you know, work with a terrific monitor engineer to just get everything really dialed right in the zone, you know, get a good mix of everybody with yourself, just a little bit more on top. That's what I like. I don't like hearing just me or something. It makes it the worst, you know. I want to hear everything. So, uh, when trying to optimize staying in tune with moderate trim use, do you have a special way of tuning your guitar? Um, well, I would say you need to use, make, make sure your guitar has a great nut on it, first of all, that it's cut properly um, by a good tech. So you could go you know, to a great guitar tech, make sure that, that, that it's as good as it can be. Use graduated height tuners with no string trees. If your guitar has any string trees, get rid of those and get some tuners that you know, get lower as you go down towards the, the high E. Uh, so just that, you know, gradual, a little bit more pressure. That's really helpful. So the nut, it all starts there. Um, at the bridge, um, there's only so much you can do, you know, and it really, it's, it is kind of dependent on what bridge you have on your guitar, but for some reason, some stay in tune better than others. John Sir seems to think it's got a lot to do with the way that the string comes out of the block, the way the ball sits in the block on a Strat style tremolo. Um, and then the way it breaks out over the saddle and there's, you know, but there's only, you know, so much that you can do, but, um, also you might want to use some, uh, lubricant in the nut, maybe some big bends, nut sauce. That's good stuff. Different companies make it, uh, slip stick is one. I, I can't remember all the different, but the Dario makes one, you know, it's stuff that you can just kind of put in the nut of, of the guitar to help, help with the friction. And, and then when you're tuning up, um, Make sure that you always tune up to the note. You know, that's a basic, but some people maybe don't know that. Like, you never want to, you know, drop the pitch of the string down to be in tune. Because then as soon as you, it always creates a little slack in the string. As soon as you bend, it'll go out, you know. So always tuning up to the note, drop the bar, tune up to the note, you know, and then see where you're at. And that's kind of what I do. Um, you know, the Eddie Van Halen thing, the way that he would do it, it does work uh like uh here's you know the old school right and this this even has a string tree on it which he had which is amazing but i've got it backed up quite high on this guitar brass nut with kind of wide slots real high and then he would use three in one oil in the brass nut to and the way that he would do the strings to the post. There's a whole video about this that you can watch online where they show you how he would do it, how he would string it. I didn't quite understand, to be honest. Like it was Chip Ellis and it was something about holding the string back here and then you only let it go at the end and not letting the ball twist. I couldn't figure out exactly what it was. But anyway, what it came down to was the bridge is mounted flush to the surface of the guitar. Um, let's, let's tune this up right now and see what... Uh,
Okay. I'm not sure if you can hear this or not, but let's see what happens if I drop the bar right now. Just one sec here. Let's see. Okay. Hear the G string and the D. If I bend now, G's now flat, but if I go like this, drop the bar, it comes right back in tune. It's pretty good. Traditional strat trim, and I'm just dropping it, right? And But as soon as I bend a note, it'll be flat. Just a little. Now if I go like this, pitch came back up. Let's try the G again. Flat. Now if I go like this, It's pretty good. It's getting a little out of tune. I haven't played this guitar for a second, so um, but it I, I set it up the way as best as I could, the way that they described in the, the video with Chip Ellis and everything, and then tuned and it was like, oh yeah, with this with the bridge mounted flush and kind of everything the way that he says to do it. You know, the, the thing is that every time you do a string bend, you need to drop the bar right afterwards. And that kind of explains a lot of the style on like Van Halen one, um, you know, it'd be like, you know, bend and then and whammy bar drop, right? He kind of developed a style around. It. I was like, oh my God, that's crazy. Um, how, how, how good it actually works. And you can see him do it live in all those videos of like, you know, live in Fresno or, you know, different videos on the first tour uh, that, that people have uploaded from kind of bad super eight videos and stuff. But the guitar sounds pretty, like, you know, it's a little out of tune at the end of the songs and stuff, but it's pretty damn good. And he's just kind of got this whole style that he developed around the dropping the bar and uh, et cetera, et cetera, you know? So anyway, um, at the end of the day, for me, it's like, oh, just use a Floyd, you know? And that's obviously what he decided to, you know, by the next album, he was already on to the, uh, you know, pretty quick to when the yellow and black showed up with the Floyd and all that. So. And then he put it on the the newly painted red and white and black guitar. <laughs> but anyways, um, I'm so far back in the chat. I'm going to move down a little bit here. I'm so far back in the super chats. I'm missing stuff. And I got to run in about uh, six minutes, guys. But um, if you need a bass player or anything, let me know. Matty Brock will vouch for me. Chris Lister. Awesome. Thanks, man. I appreciate the super chat. Thank you. And I will keep that in mind. Uh... Yeah. Have you considered a GoFundMe uh, for Pete Thorne? I think you're saying for like a new record. Um, I uh, uh, did that on the last one. I did before the demise of Pledge Music. I did a Pledge Music thing for the last one. And that went really well, actually. But I don't know if I would go that route again. Uh, I would probably just do it myself, you know, finance it and stuff. And then, uh, you know, uh yeah, uh, this is an interesting um, PSA from Mark T. Uh, when someone else is when someone is trying to connect with you musically, he says, "Don't ghost them when and if you learn they're not at your level. Just be honest with them." Y yeah, I mean, you probably want to let them down easy, you know. Like yeah, at your level, you know, it's like you know, it could sound a little like it just might be into something else that you're not. But I know what you mean. I know, I know what you're trying to say, but yeah, it could be like, yeah, I'm not exactly at this time. I mean, I tend to, I, I'm, you know, we're all guilty of, I guess at some point, probably that I've had a lot of people ask me to play on things. And then I'm like, sometimes I'm like, you know, um, and I guess I, I, it could be considered ghosting at times where I've been like, you know, if I can get to it, I will. And then I don't, and then I feel bad. And that, that's happened to me over the years for different things. People who send me tracks and, um, I mean, the, the whole thing about it is I, I really like between the work that I do personally, you know, what that I do on videos and stuff and then things that people are hiring me for, um, you know, and then trying to do my own music. It's like like probably you guys. I mean, you just you only have so much time in the day. And then if you got families and stuff, you know, it's like it's 
So it can be difficult to, it's time management, I guess is all it is, isn't it? And then what, you know, like prioritizing things, you know. Um, got to see you this past Wednesday in Hershey, says Staring Down Infinity. And man, did it sound so good. Inspiring me to go back to gigging my tubes over the digital. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, we uh, we really brought the amps out on this tour and let them loose. I'll say that, you know. There wasn't a lot of screwing around when it came to the, you know, it was like uh, James with his old four-hole Marshall and an old 60s cabinet. And I had the, the, the two PT cabs and the two PT100s and just had a great time. So uh yeah 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 uh thanks for, uh, so much for coming to the gig as well appreciate that yep uh let's see uh for those who are too young to know akai uh 1214s came before lisa say that that's right um which all came before recording in your computer that's 100 percent right the 1214 was kind of like a fancy porta studio i mean it was like a little bit more like the task and porta studio four tracks with a built-in mixer and you put the cassette in except it was a big videotape you'd put in you could do 12 tracks on it and it had a you know it was the size of i mean it would take up your desk you know pretty big this thing um and it sounded pretty good it had you know full eqs with sweepable mids in it and stuff and um you know, like a parametric mid range and stuff like that. And uh, it was, it was, a, um, you know, did a lot of work on those. I mean, it, it, the, the, the work I did on one of those got me my first record deal, you know, not me, but the band I was in, you know, the work that we did uh, got us. We recorded 50 tunes on what wrote and recorded 50 songs on a 1214 and eventually got signed by Sony in Japan, which was my first, my first record deal. Um, and so that was how that worked and then and then the adats came along by the i mean we were working on 1214 still when the adats had come along when i think about it i had a friend you know oh this new thing state-of-the-art adats or whatever and task md 88s and stuff and so by 2000 or sorry by 93 or 94 everybody was starting to get those is my memory of it you even had a last more set recording jagged little pill on adats you know that was a for, for, you know famous adat recording <laughs> Um, but they never sounded right to me. I didn't. I didn't like the sound of them, you know, because we were talking early days, 16-bit, 44-1, early, you know, converters and stuff, and they just sounded cold and distant to me. Those machines you can never get an ADAT to sound good. And then you saw this proliferation of uh, tube mic pre's and all this, you know, tube compressors and kind of, you know, I remember companies like ART and like kind of cheap, you know, the the the, the low-end studio gear of the day but everybody was making like their, their version of a tube mic pre or tube compressor some of them pretty good some of them like pv made a pretty cool one the vmp2 i think it was called like a two channel tube mic pre um yeah and and tascam had their own version of it which was superior i think and sounded better called a da88 and the da88s were a more robust kind of format it was a, a hi eight soup uh, like a like a little hi eight cassette and a smaller size cassette and they seemed like the transport was better and they would run a lot faster and uh, less hiccups and bullshit you know and they sounded pretty good too i did a lot of work on the dad when when they came out um songwriting partner of mine had one and we recorded a whole bunch of demos and it was eight track so yeah uh all right um Let's see. Um, has the CRB any class? What's this? oh classic rock? Do you mean classic rock show CRS? I think any, any plans to record now? Well, there's a, a couple DVD or you know live. A, a lot of this stuff is on YouTube, um, but you know pro mixed, pro shot uh, things out already. So it's one from Cambridge. Um, it's a PBS special on PBS TV. You might see it if you have PBS and want to watch such things. But um, there's a, it's, you know, us at Cambridge uh, doing a show this past year. Um, so that's out. You can look for that. Um, a lot of the songs are already on YouTube right now. But uh, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 let's see. 
Middle Pickup says, I played a PB Delta Blues. I think it's a class 30 with a 15. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, was great with my Strat. I've heard they're poorly built. Well, they, yeah, those they never had a great reputation for build quality. But uh, uh, you know, your mileage may vary, I guess. Um, just saw Billy Howardale plays and drop C sharp with larger magnets. Billy's got a whole style all his own, you know. He's a he's a really unique guitar player. Um, you know, the fa fascinating story. He he was Trent Res. He's the guitar player from Perfect Circle and songwriter, main songwriter, I believe, with with Maynard. Um, uh, it was really his band that he started, I think, with Maynard and. Uh, Billy uh, was guitar tech for Nine Inch Nails, and really, really interesting. The main guitar that he used to play, which was um, a Gibson Les Paul Classic, I believe, that Trent Reznor had, because he was Nine Inch Nails guitar tech, he was Trent's tech. Trent had broken it on tour because he used to smash Les Pauls all the time uh, with nails. And Billy put that guitar back together out of a uh, uh, Les Paul body and severed neck and headstock. He put a different headstock on that guitar. So the headstock was not from that guitar. Whatever had gotten, you know, it was a different broken headstock off a broken body and neck. And he somehow put that back together. And that was his main guitar in a perfect circle was this, you know, crazy Les Paul that was put together out of uh, two different Les Pauls. Kind of interesting. And he's a very, very smart guy, really ingenious guy. And, um, and then he put Tom Anderson pickups in them. I remember the H3 or HS3 or something it was called. H3, I think, with uh, really uh, high output humbuckers and great big pole pieces. And and um, he uh, had, like the Nailer amps, I think, or maybe the uh, Naked was Dave Friedman's kind of uh, slight takeoff on a Nailer. It said some things to do with Nailer and something to do with Marshall maybe, but... He used that amp a lot, I think, back in the day on the record. And now he's got a very interesting rig where he uses a combination of axe effects and stuff, as well as, I think, traditional amps. Uh, so, anyways. Um, yeah, Arthur says he's got a hard time with in-ears. Uh, totally understand that. It's not for everybody. Um, guys, I think I need to go. Uh, it's 2 o'clock, and I've got a little... Uh, uh, Date to go to the beach. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take off. I've got a super chat here. I'll just grab real quick. Um, and then I'm gonna split until next week. So uh Asheville guy says I was an engineer in Nashville during the 90s. My job as an assistant was to line two studer 24 track tape machines and sync them with the Lynx timeline. Simply sync. The kids have got it easy. They sure do. I remember doing um the the first record I made, we used we did it all on a 24 track and we tried to fit everything on one reel but we would go oh, we need tambourine and we've got eight tracks of background vocals and so we'd uh, use simpty to sync up uh, an adat <laughs> and if you ever had to do that you probably know like that was an imperfect sort of solution it worked but sometimes we'd be mixing and be like where's the tambourine we look over and the adat was spinning off into outer space because it hadn't caught the simpty and so okay stop and back to the beginning and try and get the ADAT to catch up and then it would spool back and finally catch and it was crazy but um, yeah these are these you know used to be able to put on a on a track on a on a, on a tape machine like a studer or whatever you could put simply time code and then you could sync it with another machine and the other machine would chase it and lock to the time code and so you could either do that with multiple analog machines or you could do it with something like an ADAT and uh that's what we did we got through the record but it was uh pain in the ass but yeah kids have got it easy these days for sure for sure uh enjoy the beach do you surf i don't but uh i'm kind of a fan i like to watch surfing but i like to stay on the sand uh all right uh you guys uh this was awesome i'm sorry i was late and i'll try and be more on time next week and get back into the swing of things you know a little bit more closer to 11 45 like it was supposed to be and not noon or 12 15 or whenever the hell i started i was late sorry but uh i'm gonna be working on some videos and stuff this week getting things together around here i gotta figure out my plug-in authorizations and work it all out issues issues but i'll solve it all and everything will be amazing Hey, be nice to one another. Thanks so much. Uh, appreciate you all as always. Have a terrific week. Be careful out there, but not too careful. Enjoy yourselves. Take care.